Hello, everyone. I'm Gabe Freed, a member of the Programming Committee of the Unbound Book Festival and its Director of Poetry Programming. I hope you're all safe and healthy and getting some of the uh, same spectacular weather we are here in mid-Missouri over the last week. Um, I'm choosing to think of it as a sign that we've turned certain corners, or at least that we are capable of turning certain corners. I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's poetry reading by three extraordinary poets, Tyree Day, Jennifer Chang, and Rosanna Warren, all of whom are truly among my current poetry heroes and whom I consider moreover to be part of my extended poetry family, uh, in part because of the wonderful poet people we have in common, uh, poet friends and mentors like Lisa Raspar and Mark Strand and Cornelius Eady, and Richard Howard and Gabrielle Calvacaresi. I feel as if I get to spend time with some of those cherished friends as I'm spending time with uh, this evening's uh, three poets. Before we begin, some thank yous and other business. As you may know, Unbound has always been completely free to attend, and this wouldn't be possible without the generosity of hundreds and hundreds of people who have supported us financially over the years. On behalf of everyone who volunteers for Unbound and everyone who attends these events, we're so grateful to each and every one of you who has been kind enough to give. If you'd like to help us out, please go to the website, unboundbookfestival.com, and click on the donate button on the homepage. We're a registered nonprofit and are completely run by volunteers, so everything we receive goes directly into putting on these events. Support, too, comes from the City of Columbia, specifically the Office of Cultural Affairs and the Convention and Visitors Bureau. KBIA and, CO, uh, and Como Magazine are our media sponsors. A full list of our sponsors and supporters is available on our website. Particular thanks this evening to tonight's event sponsor, the University of Missouri Friends of the Libraries, an association of donors dedicated to developing private support for the MU Libraries, which those of us who teach poetry at MU certainly appreciate. If you haven't already, please do take a moment after tonight's reading to review the whole schedule. We're about halfway through uh, the Unbound uh, schedule for 2021, and there are many wonderful upcoming events on the horizon. Lastly, while our poetry readings are not followed by a Q&A, we do encourage you to hoot and holler or clap and snap in the chat, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. I know our poets will enjoy looking back over your responses after the event. Relatedly, if you miss an Unbound event or want to rewatch one that you attended, everything is available for viewing, for viewing or reviewing on both our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Our first reader this evening is Tyree Day. Put simply, Tyree is, according to me and lots of other poetry lovers, one of the astonishing poets to emerge in the United States in recent years. In both his first collection, River Hymns, winner of the Honickman APR first, first Book Prize, and his second book, Cardinal, named a top poetry book of 2020 by the New York Times, Tyree tills local landscapes, especially those of rural North Carolina where he grew up, as he considers the possibilities and impossibilities for black safety and belonging in the context of family, towns, and America as a whole. His poems combine traditions of family storytelling, of travelogue, of prayer, of invocation, and especially of song. The music in Tyree's poems is like no one else's, even as its cad cadences feel passed on down through the ages. Uh, on my Woody Walk Home today, about 40 minutes, I listened over and over and over to him read aloud the same five minutes of poetry from the new book, Cardinal. And I feel so lucky to get to hear him read for longer in real time this evening and that we get to hear him, all of us, together. Please welcome Kaveh Kanem Fellow and 2019 Whiting Award winner, Tyree Day. Thank you so much. Be from by the nice. In my sounds gonna read them. A turkey feel 
for us. It was hunt birds, flew off holes, brown rabbits. Maybe you can't hear me. I think we're getting uh, we're getting a lot of re reverb from Tyree. Um, uh, so I think what we'll do is um, move ahead uh, to Jen and the tech. Our brilliant tech people can get Tyree. Uh, oh, Tyree is taking out his headphones. So we're going to give it another shot this way. Um, uh, so, uh, Hallam, take us back to Tyree, if you would. I took out my head and battered. Now we're still, we're still, we're still, we're still having trouble with the, uh, with the connection. Um, so we're going to, we're going to move on to, to Jen Chang and we're going to set our tech people to work on, um, on getting things figured out with Tyree. Um, and, uh, and we'll return to Tyree after, after Jen reads. Um, so, so Jen Chang is one of my all time favorite poetry dominoes. Uh, her gorgeous and dynamos, not dominoes, Jen's gorgeous and vivid poems live on the borderlands of interior and exterior spaces of geopolitical topography and the rich transformative terrain of imagination. Situated as such, Jen's poems remind us that the personal and historical are inseparable, that our imaginative spaces are infused by historical concerns, just as history is animated and defined by our profound imaginative powers. To put it another way, she's a poet of hugely expansive mind and a just as huge heart, a poet of precise and moving vision, who is always bringing together not just what we perceive, but how, how we see, how we know, how we feel. She is the author of two glorious books of poems, The History of Anonymity and Some Say the Lark, which won the prestigious William Carlos Williams Award from the Poetry Society of America. And she is Associate Professor of English at George Washington University in Washington, DC. Please give a boisterous virtual welcome to the wonderful Jennifer Chang. Wow, thank you so much, Gabe. Um, I, I, I find I'm blushing here. Uh, that is such a kind, um, such a kind introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I can't see you, but I, I feel the presence of listeners, um, and I, I wish we could be together. Um, so this. Um, I'm going to read new poems. I know that um, one is supposed to read from one's book and um, and be a good salesperson for it. But I wanted to read new poems. And I'm going to, um, I'll just, there's not a lot to say about them other than, um, well, the first poem I'm going to read for a friend who I know is, is watching tonight. And he helped me a lot with this poem. So I read it for him um, with, with great affection and admiration. And um, the poem is called Questions for Birds. I know birds are a tired presence, so I will refrain from describing this trill, that trill, the clamor outside my window. I am tired of the failure of everyone, the brothers across our alley striking the concrete, a stampede of seven-year-old feet. Again, they squawk back at the row of crows roosting the neighbor's rooftop, stopping to ask about my older child. Is it a boy or a girl? No person is an it, I chide, and do not smile. The brothers love being brothers, as sparrows must love being sparrows, swirling majestic oaks each dawn, crying, I'm awake, I'm awake. Gold-limbed and no repentance, they flee from me, still asking, but what is it of my child, their age, who pivots to better see the panoply of flocks, the clean sweep that fall migration makes of the sky? 
Which one am I? Which warbler, which wood thrush will name a self to a self? A child is a master of looking and of looking away. I know what I promised, that you are tired of the birds there in the open, their departure, a path for return. Why come back? You who tire easily, the brothers clueless to cruelty, their own and mine, the neighbors who hesitate to cross the alley, the cat who nightly slaughters, myself who permits too much self. Today I told a man, I am not you, meaning here are our differences, let us meet. I watch his careful hands soften around the gray porcelain face of a teacup, the calm shuddering of his lashes against streaming Darjeeling. I am listening, listening. All around, strangers cradle us in their restless din and ignore the story he's telling me, years rioting against the fallacies of form to become a man. Dear reader, you do not know my children or the flickering lights in the alley that revise our city into a hazy galaxy or how once my dog walked me to a field of harvest wheat, a poem I read and loved in my dreams. That I am mother to a question that my own answer to gender has been without disquiet is the world's flaw, not yours. One day we'll be old friends. One day the brothers will open in their palms a book of shame, words that spill and disappear and spill again. In the quiet of the man's pauses, I stop myself from asking, what is it? What is it? So these are poems from um, a collection that I'm trying to finish and um, they they wander in and out of mythologies they wander in and out of backyards and alleys um, of DC which is where I live with my family and where I'm um, where I'm coming to you from um, this next poem is a little bit longer and it has some of this kind of meandering quality um, wandering in and out of memory and um, and out of imagination and reality, as Gabe so um, nicely put it. Um, and it's the title poem of the manuscript. An Authentic Life. For most of my life, I did not know or understand the names of things I saw every day. Sugar maple, crepe myrtle. I mistook ignorance for wonder, wonder for grace. As a child, I watched a friend as she rode English style, not knowing English was not the same as American. It was a lesson. From a bench, I watched my friend play master, envied her riding crop, her khaki job first. I loved horses only in theory, by watching. No horses hid in my toy chests, no lessons my parents would have strained to pay for. I had not been taught to ask questions. What is this? Who are you? Why? I had not been taught to want. My family was not poor exactly. We simply had no imagination for pleasure. To us, it was hard enough being American. Pleasure, as I've learned, is a will to knowledge. I would never, like my friend, sit straight back atop a horse. Even in Arizona, years later, an adult, I curled into the animal holding me, overwhelmed. I was riding Western style up the side of a mountain, the name of which I've long forgotten, tottering over the ground, over the horse, over the dust, scratching at my throat. I laughed into my horse in what I considered Western style. When older white people speak to me, they assume I had been a child fluent in deprivation, that hardships were endured to stand before them. Do they think she has never ridden a horse nor driven aimless towards the California coast? Do they think she has not disobeyed her masters? Once I watched others ride, and now I was riding, that golden memory, the nights it took to reach red dirt and not even see the Grand Canyon. Was that my deprivation? 
that golden memory of holding and rising. I read a story about a boy who'd wounded horses at a stable. One night he found them motionless in their stalls. He was a groomer or a collector of oddly colored stones. Torn loose by time, he merely mistook which animal was in captivity. I remember thinking his violence had something to do with the Latin word for horses, the noun, a crown of meaning. What looked like equality, I deemed it so the horse and I sharing a kind of understanding, the horse and I companionate, if not comparable, which is to say, the horses failed the boy for being neither human nor wild enough, the excess of their submission forming an ache to give expression to. I did not ride the horse, only watched. I was a child fluent in deprivation, wasn't I? Now that I think of it, I read the story wrong. It was not a boy, but a man in the field, and it was not a horse, but the child of himself, standing astride. The field, relentless, tall grasses wounding us with their ghostly braying. What I remember keeps happening, the sun chasing at my back, the chance to ride, infrequent as freedom, everyone watching. Um, this next poem is about a walk in the woods, um, and a conversation. And it's, it's also, uh, the conversation is, is loosely about Orpheus and Eurydice. And I think that's all you need to know, but, um, it, it came of an actual experience where, um, during this pandemic time with so little to do, um, I decided we needed to take a walk to look for a tree. Um, that we did eventually find, um, but that doesn't happen in the poem. The Lonely Humans. A type of hickory, it grows by water. So are we fools to drive to the river the day after our most savage storms have finally stopped to see a tree we've never seen before to hike in cold mud through a leafless forest, to behold clearings now cluttered by whatever fell last night, mostly oaks, no hickory, to attend the mad performance of a newly roaring current. I do not want to call it singing, the wounded poet's head howling down river. Remember, we scorned his broken heart, broken rashly by himself, some say, for wanting love too soon. You say I am unfair, that too much rain is what makes the river rush. There is no we in what you say, dear. We hear it as mythology. We hear it outside ourselves, a surfeit of music, quickening wind against winter trees, branch taps a mistake for premonitions. Of what? That the tree is here, ready to spring to life again. I am unfair. I want to love honestly. I want love honest. Every tree is the wrong tree. This is a direction we get lost in. Beach, sweet gum, more oak. But she was impatient too, you say. It is possible she willed him to look back. We do not love alone, is what I think you mean. When I walk behind you, the back of your head is golden ungovernable light I cannot look away from? Is it love that to follow you, I find myself choosing an unexpected path? Long gone are the leaves alternate, compounded, each an arrow, the thrust of a green thought. Along the forest floor, centuries crack and turn to dust. We have children, grudges, a Dionysian mortgage, habits mostly bad, and yet every December, I imagine spring, our time past and to come, how when you follow me, I track the blazes to reach the river, and often I have to stop myself from looking back. To stay together, look away, some God said. Here in these trees, our voices have no faces. We've walked like this for an eternity.
and um, read one last poem. And uh, thank you for listening. The last horse I rode. I think of the people my children will love, the slow lingering of a horse in the shade. I wrote out on it once, more wind than woman, subject to a direction I could not determine. I rode farther, or I rode not at all, a condition I felt since young, the capacity to be gone and yet here. I held like weather, adrift, atmospheric, watching my children, not sure whether to love or not love the world, meaning they were not sure whether to love or not love themselves. It is not enough to trust the sky to be parent to this. The rotation of the earth will not be parent to this. To care is not the work of the weather. It is not meteorological. It is unkind. It is a kind of hardship to care. I am so lonely right now. When one child was small, he tore papers to pieces. I thought he liked the swift shriek of a good rip. He is musical, I thought. He is strong. He tore artwork, drafts, newspapers, registered mail, lists we wrote to ourselves, lists of promises to each other. He tore a map I'd drawn of a town we lived in before he was born. He tore apart the past. He tore money, actual bills government forms. He tore apart the future. Every burden that wakes us in the middle of the night awaits him in the morning. He tore it apart, and I would make him repeat after me, we do not hurt, we are kind. We do not hurt, we are kind. Who in this world will love him? Who will hold his hand when he is wrong? Mama, what are you doing? What are you writing? I am writing a poem about the last horse I rode across the alpha alfalfa meadow, out west, clusters of sage. My horse stepped gingerly over the air, a luminosity upon my face, the shock of living that I once believed would outlast me. And what will you think when we rest hungry as animals in that dryness, what the poet in me wants to describe as seer? What will you admit when the people who will someday love you ask if your mother sang to you, if her words brought comfort, what silences did she lay out in the tall grass looming taller, hoping to become a meadow, more profuse, the plenty you will never understand until it is gone. If the world could not love you back, if your mother could not say hush, how often must I draw open the windows and not know and not see the seer, the searing, that the sounds we could not call human were human. My children, you must love in kind the world, the people. You must kindly love the rain eroding another weekend, the flowers late fall, hickory bark, and acres of tree fall, and then love the rain not coming at all. Thank you. Jen, that was, that was an astonishing new poem. Um, thank you so much. And your canon of horse poems <laughs> is, is growing and growing. I, I, we could make a whole volume of your poems with horses in them. Thank you. I don't even ride horses. <laughs> well, that's the imagine. That's the imagination we were talking about. Only a theory. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see you and to have you here. So we're going to go back to Tyree, and and hopefully our our whiz bang tech people have gotten this figured out. Tyree, are you with us? Yes. How do I sound? You sound angelic. Great. Uh, those poems, Jennifer, are so, so good. Um, all right, so I thought, uh, just hearing you read kind of made me want to change the order a little bit of how I want to read, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Um, I'm going to start with the first poem in, in Cardinal. Field notes on leaving. Geography could not save me. The North Star is irrelevant, miles and miles above my head. I don't want constellations any nearer. I know there are whole cities all over this country, so bright you can't see the stars, the sky no wider than the heart is wide. 
The night President Obama was elected, we danced in the street of our small university to my president is black. My first time on my own, I was bright and felt like I had a father. Every one of us was flying. A blunt passed around, we got lifted. My heart to lift, all the world to explore. If there were stars, we could hold them. I've never been through airport security without being pulled to the side and searched. To know you can die anywhere doesn't feel like flying anywhere. I can't go to Canada and leave my mama here alone. If you see me dancing a two-step, I'm sending a starless code. We're escaping everywhere. I can't afford to think like Whitman that whomever I meet on the road I shall love and whoever beholds me shall love me. Doing the Dougie, trying to find the ocean, looking everywhere. When I left, a turkey vulture lifted from a field I still love. It was hunting season. Birds flew off at the sound of rifles. We warred with brown rabbits. The vulture's head was bald and, and delicate like the old men in their hats with names on them like Ford, USA, and Dodgers to cover their soft skin. Old men who stood in front of the breakfast truck stop across from the field, the butter partly melted in the middle of the grits. They also saw the vulture, knew how to scavenge, gathered like horses or stars in a junkyard looking for a rusted pearl. Those old men have died in their sleeps by now, though no field could care how many will fall in it and why. I want to sit here tonight still in love and vultureless, listening to Sade. I'm still the boy who walked through a dying sweet potato field, though our small town wouldn't recognize me now. I have a different body, a dented body, fieldless and far gone. By land. I've lived on dirt roads that bent and ended at a gate of ponds. The dust skipped up, didn't make my mother look like a dream I've lived on roads that dragged through America. I've paced only them to the next town. The road we kissed on is gone, rich folks buying up all the city in which we make do. I miss when Sonny could do a willy all the way down Person Street and no one would call the police because he was a part of the neighborhood like the honeysuckle bush between two yards. And he was beautiful, not like a horse standing alone in a yellow field, but like a man is beautiful. Most of the little towns have a road nicknamed Devil's Turn, where someone's brother died on a Saturday night while Nina sang, tell me more and more, and then some on the caddies radio, the moon, the color of the Otis Cardinal. Every road isn't a way out. Some circle back like wolves. You can't get lost on them and they won't lose you. Others wait for you to run out of gas. They come alive with what your mother said would take you. Every road promises something like a father does. But when you arrive, the town is empty and you wait like a child questioning everything. The road itself laughing like a drunk man falling into a roadside ditch. The road I'm walking now is howling and full of moon. Hopefully it will lead to myself. Hopefully they'll take me home. I want it to place an ocean. I tell my uncle's ghost, don't waste your time hunting white folks who owe you money. I try to give him my body, but he won't take it and pulls his wagon on. I began in fields near ponds where we laughed and fried fish. If someone were to sing, it would grow through each ghost and be heard as geese crossing overhead. 
The dead know the work they have done. And if they are not careful, their hands will stay in the shape of that work. My hands haven't touched cotton or tobacco. I haven't pulled small green worms or carried them inside with me hidden in the body's doublings. I was only a child in harvested fields. When my people let the cotton sleep, there were no vacations. The fields of Roseville belonged to my kinfolk dead and alive, and I don't know if my great-grandparents ever saw the ocean or fell asleep on the beach. All right, y'all, um, just, just two more poems. Um, let's see. The Mechanical Cotton Picker for Black Chicago Poets. It wasn't that they killed John Boy in front of his mama's small blue house and that no one called her Miss Bluebird anymore. Out of respect, though she never minded the name, it made her believe she'd fly off someday. Or that the sheriff let John Boy's body sit until even the baby stopped crying, their eyes filled with him, his body already going to marble, no one would be able to lift from their sleep. It was that we could feed ourselves then by getting down on our hands and knees to pick cotton and most knew what a body smelled like blowing down a dirt road. When Chicago reached my ear, the war was full of bodies. They sent whole train cars for us black folk. I read the defender and waited to hide my face behind the curtains of a northbound train and I prayed the train car would fly. The South truly don't want us to go. A Mississippi cop would catch a family disappearing behind a rainstorm and send them home, the clouds leaving four muddy fields at a time. I left like a season's first lover across a window, slowly like a southern sun diagonal on a work back. I wanted to carry my aunts to Chicago with me like this obituary field Bible, these plums I got saved purpling in my bag. Uh, a few more actually. Um, let's see. From which I flew. Only together holding their hands in silence can I see what a field has done to my mother, aunts and uncles. The land around my grandmother's old tin roof has changed. I doubt she recognized it from above. How many blackbirds does it take to lift a house? I'll bring my living, you wake your dead. We have nowhere to go, but we're leaving anyhow by many ways. When they ask why you want to fly blackbird, say, I want to leave the South because it killed the first man I love and so much more killing. Say my son's name. His death was the first thing to break me in and fly me through town. If grief has a body, it wears his Dodgers cap and still walks to the corner store to buy lottery tickets and Budweiser 40s. I don't like what I have to be here to be. All the blackbirds with nowhere to go keep leaving. All right, I think I'm just gonna read one more. Thank you again uh, for having me carry me after Langston Hughes. I follow the shimmer far down a road I still haven't found the ending to. I picked up my life. My mother sewn a map to the back of. So one day I lay it out and travel back to the flat land of Eastern North Carolina. I map to land where my body will die, where my ghosts won't ride the trains all night, count steps from liberty to home. I tried to find the ocean before I was covered in Southern soil. I put my head underneath the Atlantic, swallowed so many memories. I'm filled with people. Someone has taught me to fly. Whichever way I flew, my inheritance couldn't be, left, be lifted from northeastern North Carolina's wet clay, its hands hardened around my already weighted ankles. My mother's mother planted hydrangeas 
where I, where I wanted to place an ocean, where I wanted to place an ocean, she grew me. I picked up my life for it was the only one I had to pick up. How the body must pick itself up if no one is around to offer a rounded hand out of the snow that only buries. Stuck to my life were the same things I carry back with me now. My father's lying, I've mastered and wear the way I fear, I feel wears the bones of birds. The green tint of gin bottles, my uncles made of their bare nights. My mother, the only reason I have something to pick up. Thank you. Tyree, thank you so much. Uh, it's really such a pleasure to hear you read those poems. The, the new book is so extraordinary. Well, thank you, thank you. So our next, our third reader this evening is the remarkable Rosanna Warren. Uh, I first encountered Rosanna's poems in her second book, uh, Stained Glass, which was published, I think, in 1994. Her poetry has captivated me ever since. The effusiveness of its rhythms, the wisdom it discovers as it unfurls, the ethicalness that comes from, playing, from paying such close attention to the surrounding world. In my mind, Rosanna is a descendant of Elizabeth Bishop, of Theodore Rethke, of Amy Clampett. She's one of our most eminent literary figures, recipient of awards from the Academy of American Poets, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Lila Wallace Foundation, and the Guggenheim Foundation, among others. She was a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets from 1999 to 2005, and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. She is the Hannah Holborn Gray Distinguished Service Professor in the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Her new book of poetry is So Forth, just out from W.W. W. Norton. Rosanna, we are so happy to have you here at Unbound. Well, welcome. Thank you, uh, Gabe. And I want to say I'm really honored uh, to read with Jennifer and Tyree. It's, it's just lovely to hear those passionate poems. I too am going to read some new work. This one is called Bolitas. And it seems to be about mushrooms, but it's really about politics. It was about being in the United States in 2020 when not only a medical plague was stalking us, but a, I'd say a political plague even worse. Boletus. Crickets are stitching the afternoon together. What the squalling catbird rends, crickets relentlessly repair. The maple shivers, sends yellowed messages sailing down. Too much has ripped. Half the main branch cracked off and hangs, teetering across lower boughs leaving on the trunk a blonde wound. We cross the brook on stepping stones and climb west up the mountain flank through laurel thickets, along the scooped out valley of beaches, up the stream bed to sit on a fallen tree. But there's no rest. We carry with us what we left below, a country clawing its very idea to shreds. The scarlet boletus mushroom prongs from decaying wood. In its bishop's amaranth skull cap, it stands its ground. One kind will nourish, the other sickens, but not like the white amanita bringing on liver failure, seizures death. This poem takes its title from the famous song of the Rolling Stones, Dead Flowers. And uh, uh, Tyree, I have a vulture here too. Dead flowers. If you hurt yourself before someone else hurts you, is that homeopathic? Watch me prick Poison into my skin, sign my name in pain. Watch me miss the appointment, cancel the call. 
Watch me gulp smoke and receive a certificate of enlightenment between the smeared egg yolk horizon to the west and the bone white eastern sky. The emperor appoints me to the poetry bureau and I declare myself queen of the underground. On the back road, the turkey vulture plucked the guts from the squashed squirrel then flapped up to the dead branch of the shagbark hickory to examine us examining the carcass. Oh, sacerdotal bird, with your crimson scalp and glossy vestments, teach us to tr translate the spasm, the cry, the disintegrating flesh, the regret. What can be made of all this grief? Over the butter, yellow, humming, feather grassed, midday meadow, skim the shadows of vultures, ghostly six foot wingspan, V, swiftest signature, turning death into speed. And here's one looking back to youth. Still life, not silk roses, but two mackerel. Purchased that morning at the stall in Campo dei Fiori, vaguely silver, but tarnishing fast, slumped across a plate I'd set up for art. Their eyes blurred. Art filled the apartment with odors of turpentine and decomposing flesh, their gills sagged. Oh, but I was determined. By the second day, they'd sunk into themselves. I was 18 and seriously virginal. My friend composed hieratic, petrified bouquets whose silk daisies, peonies, and roses would never wilt her canvas, an Egyptian tomb, and she, a priestess. In my rotting fish, I smelled a future, not yet touched, in which the man who had held me turned away as bonfire light licked the waves, and someone strummed a lute, and far out beyond the dark harbor, Lights from fishing boats blinked, and I knew I'd spend that night alone on the damp sand. It was like being born. At dawn, the boats returned. The fishermen sold their catch, wet starlight, still twitching from tubs along the quay. Night still a quiver in the fish's eyes. Burning the bed. Carefully, you balanced the old mattress against the box spring to create a teepee on that frozen December patch behind the house, carefully, you stacked cardboard in the hollow and touched the match to corners till flame crawled along the edges in a rosy smudge before shooting 25 feet into darkening air. Fire gilded each looming shadowed tree, gilded our faces as we stood with shovel and broom to smack down sparks so much love going up in smoke. It stung our eyes, our lungs. Pagodas, terraces, domes, boudoirs flared, shivered, and crumpled as the light caved in. Privacies curled to ash wisp. Towers toppled where once we'd warmed each limb, fired each nerve, ignited each surprise, and now at dusk, our faces reddened in heat, so 
artfully lit. We needed all that past, I thought, to face the night. Um, I've been living in a cabin in the <laughs> quite remote Catskill Mountains for the last year, uh, driven here by COVID-19. And we have a lot of wildlife and hardly see any other human beings. Here's a visitor we had from the wild. Um, this poem came out in the New Yorker just this week. Number theory. The four and a half foot black backed rat snake swayed up and across the kitchen screen door, seeking a way in, encountering instead our eyes. It slowly, deliberately withdrew to slide across the stone porch, over the wall and along the foundation, inspecting every crevice, feeling, nosing, listening its way toward a solution, which it found around the corner, up the back flagstone steps, where it squeezed its impossible length and girth, inch by patterned inch, into the crack beneath the topmost slate. So we know we're living with a patient companion like you, inquisitive. You sit taut in your chair, whispering as you probe the gaps between prime numbers until infinity. It's pattern you seek, the opening through which your thought will glide suddenly into a lit space and be at home in a shaky house where wasps gnaw the walls. And here's another snake. Small dead snake. As when I approached what I feared and didn't want to see, the small rat snake curled where it died struggling in the glue trap set for mice. And I cried out and twisted my hands, but returned to take up the trap with gloved fingers, tipped it into a plastic bag and carried it to the woods on a shovel and dug a hole in dense root woven earth, buried it, then looked up where tall leafy branches of beech and oak carded strands of cloud. So I tried to ease with both hands gently out of my chest, my fears for you, my stories about what I feared for you and tried to lift the stories free, to place them out of sight, beyond the grasp of my belief, beyond horror, but not beyond knowing what traps I had set for you, for me. And just two, two short ones. The good life. Yeah, this is, I just remarked, this is all one sentence. I kind of like that. The good life. Reflecting pool, patio, intricate brick walks and a garden wall. Each time I visited, a trellis had been moved, an arbor transplanted, and inside the house, sofas replaced, walls shifted, thick plush carpets reborn in different hues, so that we drifted 
my friend and I on our play dates in a metamorphic universe in flux through which her parents hovered in rare manifestations like ghosts in a seance, the father almost invisible, the blonde mother with haggard quattrocento face surging up from time to time, then melting away, her speech mysteriously muffled, never interfering with our hide and seek, our doll tea parties, our hours drawing imaginary worlds, and all the while the gold swans indentured as faucet handles in the bathroom guarded the master swan from whose gilded beak a stream of water would satisfyingly spurt so that it would be years before the enchanted kingdom dissolved forever in a delirium tremens my friend had long since fled, leaving the grown-ups to their games of hiding and seeking, hiding and fruitless seeking amidst the cloud-capped towers and baseless fabrics of ever-renewed upholstery. And to conclude, um, two years ago before COVID-19, and it was possible to travel. I went for the first time in my life to Japan for a few weeks and visited temples in Kyoto. And this is a little poem about an amazing, famous Zen temple called the Ten Ryuji Temple, um, where there was a famous garden and lake designed by the master um, so uh, Soseki, Muso Soseki. Soseki's Shrine. The mother bear stands on her hind legs to bat hard green apples from the boughs while two cubs slide up the trunk as if black water should flow upward and disappear in shuddering leaves. The third cub rummages for fruit in tall grass. The apples are tiny and sour. The bears are hungry, working hard. The whole meadow strives, shakes with striving as crickets thrum and dragonflies slice the air and overhead the peregrine falcon floats its high staccato cry. My fingers are stained with ink. In Kyoto, in Soseki's ancient temple, the stone basin for mixing ink stands upright a shrine to writing, at its base, water in a trough, a dipper. One dips, one pours water over one's hands. One prays to write purely how hard when we want so much. We're hungry. We want to leave our names. Scholar's hands, the exiled researcher told me, holding my hands in hers. Calluses, ink stains, rough cuticles, hands that work. She's dead now. Muso Soseki's pond has lasted for 700 years. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And thank you to Tyree and Jen. Uh, it was really a memorable reading. Uh, and thank you again to this evening's sponsor, MU Friends of the Library. Unbound will be on a short hiatus until March 18th, when we'll return with our next event, Show Me Stories, featuring short fiction writers Ron Austin, Mary Troy, and R.M. Kinder. We hope to see you then. Good evening.